that's one of the things about religion that we have to remember when we're talking about that makes it such a, a hot topic issue is because we're talking about law. Who gets to be God? Who gets to be God's deputies? Who is the most high? Who is the divine authority? It's all about the claim to the most high. The only way that somebody can be higher than us is if we give away our power. Because there's nobody, we're all equal. But we're not equal in our knowledge, so ultimately, I think it does have to be a hierarchy, but it has to be a cooperative hierarchy, like a bee colony. We have to, it's about what our value system is, what we care about. mind. I am your host, Brandon Martin, and welcome to the 32nd Cubbyhole Podcast, where important topics are unveiled, discussed, and tested. Today is November 21st, 2020, and please make sure to check out all of our previous episodes and content on the Cubbyhole website, which is cubbyhole.com. At C U B B Y W H O L E dot com. So today we are going to be continuing with the methods of manipulation. Now we have been covering the methods of manipulation for the past 12 or so episodes. And this list includes the method of obfuscation, worldview poisoning, primal fears, divide and conquer indoctrination, controlled opposition, the financial system, control of the media, food and medicine, the illusion of time, and we ended on the DHR factor in our last episode. So today we are going to be moving through religion and binding as a means of manipulating the human consciousness into a specific level so that the occult ruling class can continue to reign over this dominion and keep the chains locked around our minds as tight as they can be. Now, obviously, religion is going to be a vast topic. Actually, the next three, religion, subversive symbolism, and chaos sorcery, are all going to take a little bit more time than I expected because these need to be explained and flushed out thoroughly. Now, I could never possibly give the totality of that information in one show. So this is more going to be an introduction and a means to whet your appetite into doing your own due diligence into researching these subjects for yourself. So if you're expecting me to get into all the little minutia about religion and the debates that go on philosophically about religion, this show will not be about that. This show will specifically pertain to discussing the etymology of the word religion and its use in magic or magical terms, and also getting to the basics of the root core of what all religions share in common, and also showing how This institutionalized belief system has been used against humanity to ensure to keep the bondage on the hearts and minds of men all over the world. All religions have a connectivity to them because they are all rooted in ancient Egyptian sciences. They are all rooted in totemic sociology and the three hero cults. So we will be discussing the three basic hero cults also, if I have time to get to that. But hopefully we're going to move through the basics of religion here today, and then move into the connected importance of astrotheology when it comes to religion. Now all this information is really going to help us with our upcoming episodes about allegory in the future that me and Nate are about to produce. Now, all religions share a core of truth to them. So, I want to make it very clear that we should not throw the baby out with the bathwater. 
when it comes to this, we have to work with what we got. So in no way is this to give credibility to another religion, which is known as atheism. And I will be going in depth about atheism in the near future. But I want to make it highly clear that this is not to promote an atheistic worldview. And we will see that atheism is just another false dogmatic belief system that holds back the forward progression of humanity. So what I'm speaking about specifically is institutionalized religious belief systems, a blind faith in these institutionalized way of thinking. So we're going to look at the correspondence to the triune brain as well as we continue further into this discussion. See, what most people are buying into is the exoteric cover stories of religion. Now, what we are trying to do is to get to that center core, that center essence of truth that is underneath all the exoteric garbage that we're fed. We want to get through by taking the path of esoteric understanding, the esoteric knowledge, that is, to lead us to an understanding which can help to reveal that center core of truth that all religious ideologies do share and hold. As of now, we have slides that go along with each episode, which you can find at the Cubbyhole website on the podcast page right underneath the description of the episode that you're watching. So for this episode, there will be its corresponding slides, and I highly recommend that you check them out and follow along by looking at the slideshow that's provided on the Cubbyhole website. Now, as Napoleon Bonaparte said, religion is excellent stuff for keeping the common people quiet. And this is because religion is naively and blindly believed by common people as absolutely true. And contrary to this, the wise, the philosophers, or what I have coined the agosophers, meaning agape, which is universal love, combined with sophia, or sophi, which means wisdom. So it's the universal love for wisdom. So agosophers. Um, that's just a, a word that I've coined um, because I see the limitations in philosophy. Um, and we will open that up in a future show, I hope. But as I was saying, the wise see it as false. And by the rulers of this world, it is seen as one of the most useful implements of their knowledge to keep people suppressed and keep people in their place and docile so they never rise up and challenge the powers that be. And this is why we're going to be speaking about binding, because it is a magical or rather a form of sorcery that is being used. Now, like I said, I am talking about false institutionalized religious belief systems that advocate for violence and hold back the evolution of our consciousness and also hold back our ascension process. As the great philosopher Voltaire said, those who can make you believe absurdities can make you commit atrocities. That's what we are trying to look at here is the belief in these absurd dogmas that lead us to creating behaviors from which the consequences of such behaviors are detrimental to our overall well-being as a species. So here's another quote from one of the founding fathers, which happens to be one of the individuals that I read first when um, studying the founding fathers when I was a child. 
uh, is Thomas Paine. I read his book, The Rights of Man, which I would highly recommend for the layman to start to catch up with some of this information. Um, I highly recommend reading the actual documents that the Founding Fathers, especially the non-federal Founding Fathers, he was one of the core philosophers when it came to the foundation of this country and things like freedom and sovereignty. As he most astutely stated, I do not believe in the creed professed by the Jewish church, by the Roman church, by the Greek church, by the Turkish church, by the Protestant church, nor by any church that I know of. My own mind is my own church. All national institutions of churches, whether Jewish, Christian, or Turkish, appear to me no other than human inventions set up to terrify and enslave mankind and monopolize power and profit. I mean, we could just drop the show there and leave it alone because he just said everything that we need to say pretty much. Organized religion is simply there to maintain their power and gather more power and obviously gather more profit. This exactly states what organized religion is really about. It is a methodology of manipulation through fear intended to mind control its followers. They want to play on the naivete of individuals and also their primal fear because they want to utilize our lack of self-knowledge against us because this is really about the fear of the unexplored aspects of ourselves and the realm in which the self operates in. So they use this unknowingness, this fear of the unknown to manipulate us and steer us into mental cages. See, what organized religion does not teach you, at least one aspect of it, is that you need no priest between you and the divine. You have a direct connection to the creative force that underlies reality. And anybody who stands in between you to gain profit as a third party is exploiting you. They are exploiting your gullibility and your lack of understanding your own connection to the holistic creative force that we all experience and co-experience together every single day. I mean, this is literally about becoming your own shaman, your own priest, understanding that your mind is your own church, understanding that your body is your temple, and that it is only through the introspection of these unexplored aspects of ourselves can we come to fully awaken to this truth that nobody can stand in between you and your connection to the all. Go back to the hermetic principle of mentalism and you can really understand what I'm talking about here. So let's go ahead and take a look at the word religion. The word religion comes from the Latin word religare, which means to tie back, to hold back, and to bind fast or to fashion, to tie something together, to fashion it together. So we can just say it means binding. But what do we mean when we say binding? What are we talking about? Especially when it connects to occult practices or by magical means. Binding is a magical term that is descriptive of a class of spells intended to thwart the progress, intended to thwart or hold back the progress of an imposing force or practitioner. So as we can see by this definition, we are talking about holding something back to thwart its movements or to restrict it because it is interfering with what our agenda may be. So what is religion binding? 
If it's a binding spell, then what is it binding? Well, it is binding your own progress as an individual to getting to the objective truth about the nature of the thing or about the nature of yourself, about your true purpose, about your meaning, about the true connectivity to the divine. Now, it ostensibly seems that religion would try to reconnect you to the divine. But as we know, and as we see as it is applied, it does far less to give us any of these deep philosophical questions and ontological issues that we have about ourselves and, and, the, and the nature of reality. So it is in the exoteric realm binding us back from getting to that core truth, from getting to that true gnosis of our own infinite value and the knowledge that is needed for us to create real change, to really evolve our species. Because really what we're trying to do is to stimulate neurodevelopment, to stimulate our nervous system so that we can evolve into a higher type. And religion, for the most part, at least the dark occult religious belief systems that are passed to us as organized religion in our modern day, thwart us from getting to that goal. It actually restricts us from that ascension process. So it physically binds us as well because what happens in the mind, if amplified to a certain degree, will take patterns in the physical form. So manif the manifested result will be restricted because of that restriction in the mental realm. So religion is pretty much saying that its outer shell, its outer story. Now, I'm obviously speaking in very general terms here. So these are extreme generalities. This is not the 100% absolute. I do want to clarify on that. But generally, what they are saying as this is the truth is that exoteric version of their stories never really getting to the essence or the allegorical nature of the religious teachings that are brought down to us. So how does this play out when it comes to the triune brain that we've spoken about so many times? So we're going to take the principal correspondence and look at what happens, generally speaking, again, um, in our neuro neurological activity. Well, what happens here is you get two forms of brain imbalances. You have the chronic left brain imbalance, which roots us in materialism and scientism and rigid skepticism, and it manifests this control apparatus known as government. Now, the word government, which I know we've broken down, but just to rehash on it a little bit, it comes from the Latin word gubernare. The V's are translated into V's because they didn't have V's in Latin, in um, old Latin, classical Latin. Um, but it comes from gubernare, meaning to control, and then mente, or mens mentes, which means the mind. This is where we get our word mental. And... So we, if we put these two together, then we see that it literally means mind control. And what does this mean? Well, it's another form of binding. So when an individual falls into the left brain imbalance, what will happen is that it will bind the right brain. It will control the right brain by suppressing the right brain activity and modalities. In doing so, an individual will suffer from the lack of creativity and higher level feeling, which includes the functions of our moral compass. So we can see why this is a very useful tactic for government because they want to keep us in an amoral mindset or a moral rel or a moral relativistic mindset to ensure that this system of slavery continues the way it's meant to continue. So in contrast to that, 
the chronic right brain imbalance, which will put primacy on the spiritual only, where nothing in the material happens, no physical slavery really matters, nothing that we do here matters because you know, we can just be saved by going and confessing our sins and atoning for our bad deeds, bad deeds magically. But this imbalance will work against and bind the left brain modalities and functionalities. So this is the chronic right brain imbalance, which will put us in religious think. The chronic left brain imbalance will put us in government think, in authority think. So the right brain will put us into submission without questions. You know, we'll be in the modality of just obedience. Obey and never question anything. In doing so, an individual will suffer from the lack of logic and higher level thinking, which includes our ability to reason. So religion binds our ability to reason. It ensures that we abdicate our higher level processing faculties of logic and it binds our ability to think critically. So with both of these control apparatuses in play on the field of reality, we can see why it's so hard to break our mental chains and really get into holistic think where we're using both sides of our brains, where we're using both hemispheres and also both polarities of consciousness in balance with each other, which creates our true homeostasis. It allows us to ascend and connect to our higher selves because without this balance, we do not have the access to that ascension process. So it is very crucial for the dark occult to keep, to keep these two methodologies of sorcery and manipulation in play to ensure that both polarities of our consciousness are kept in a chronic imbalance, which makes us very easy targets for predators. Now, one of the things that exoteric religious cover stories are obscuring from the average common individual's view is the esoteric understanding of astrotheology. Now, I would say that this is the common thread that all religions share in common, and that is astrotheology. Now, astrotheology can be simply stated to be the worship of gods or deities that include the visible planets, the stars, the sun, and the moon. So astrotheology can also be said the, to be the study of the movements of the stars, the planets, the sun, and the moon in correlation with our archetypal psychology. There are two distinctive fields to astrotheology. One, dealing with the the external worship of deities or gods in the heavens, and the other dealing with the internal understanding and comprehension of our archetypal nature through allegorical understanding. So there are three basic sets of study when it pertains to astrotheology that are rooted in the three ancient totemic hero cults. This is the study of the stars, specifically the northern pole star and the southern pole star from the Nile Valley, and all the heavenly bodies, including the sun and moon. So the stellar cult was the most ancient, existing around 300,000 years ago to 150,000 years ago. Now that is a rough estimate. There is evidence to show that they could have existed up to 600,000 years ago. But that is not the major point that I'm trying to make here. I'm just giving uh, a brief correspondence into these ancient cults in correlation with astrotheology and a little bit of their timeline, which I would highly recommend just going to Douglas Martin's presentation the superior knowledge of the ancient Egyptians 
to understand more about these things. But we will be opening these three cults up in the future. Um, today, I'm going to primarily focus on the solar cult doctrine and correlate it to Christianity and show how this plays out. So then we have the lunar cult that came after the stellar cult and existed from around 150,000 years ago to 50,000 years ago. And then the most recent and most dominant, most people should have a small understanding of this correspondence, which is the solar cult. And like I said, that's the one I'm going to be focusing on here today. So the solar cult came into being roughly around 100,000 years ago to the present day, which we find in the modern religious belief system known as Christianity. Now, of course, there was a more ancient version of Christianity that was less perverted and corrupted in its mythology. But modern Christianity, especially exoteric Christianity, is based in astrotheology. Now, like I said, this is a pre-existing mythos regarding the astral bodies in the heavens, being primarily the sun, but it does incorporate the moon and planets and stars. But the sun is overlapping the other two. So this is what is known as solar doctrine overlap or solar cult overlap now the ancients were endeavoring to bring the old in with the new so we always find remnants of the pre-existing cults or mythos within the new mythos you just have to dig deep enough and get beyond the exoteric versions of it so the attributes of the three ancient hero cults were assigned to each of the three major religions of our world the sun which rules the day sky, was assigned to the solar cult of Christianity. The moon, or lunar cult, was assigned to the Islamic belief system, and the stellar cult has been assigned to Judaism. So these are the three major world religious belief systems and organized religious institutions. Christianity is found mostly in the Western Hemisphere. And this can be correlated to our l chronic left brain imbalance. This is because the Western culture is the most dominant. They are definitely the most disproportionate when it comes to scientific belief or scientism. The complete obsession with materialistic gains is blatantly obvious. We are obsessed with survival modality. This also corresponds to the yang energy. Its primary symbol is the cross. Now this cross is the cross of the zodiac. And its day of worship is obviously Sunday, which corresponds to the sun. The lunar cult is obviously associated with Islam. If we take a look at the Islamic flag, we can see that it is a crescent moon and star. Now some hypothesize that it is the morning star and this is the crescent of Venus because we can never see Venus in its whole aspect. We only see it as a crescent. But either way, they both are representing the sacred feminine principle which relates to the right brain aspects and the feminine polarity of consciousness. Now, its day of worship is on Friday, and Friday is named after the Norse lunar goddess, Freya, and I will get to this in a little bit. So Islam is found mostly in the eastern hemisphere of the planet, which plays into the correlation to the way our psychology plays out and the feminine aspects of our consciousness, which one of its primary teachings is to submit to God. And I believe even the word Islam means to submit to God. One of their primary rituals is where they walk counterclockwise seven times around the black Kaaba, which is the shrine that represents the center of the Milky Way, the black hole in the center of the Milky Way. Obviously, there's 
plenty of Freudian psychology that one could dig into with this symbolism. So as we can see here, this also associates with the sacred feminine because darkness or blackness is associated with the feminine principle. Now Judaism is the modern variant of the stellar cult. So Judaism was assigned to the stellar and planetary cult. Their day of worship is on Saturn's day or Saturday. Their symbol is an upward equilateral triangle and an inverted equilateral triangle combined together to make the Star of David. So it is a six-pointed figure consisting of two interlaced triangles. Now Judaism is obviously found everywhere. It has connections to Christianity and the Islamic tradition. In this modern variant of the stellar mythos, they venerate into the planet Saturn because it is the furthest visible planet away from the sun, which also represents the black sun. The cult, this is where we get the cult of the black sun from also, for those who have done a little bit of research into that. In our current variant of Christianity, Jesus takes up the role of the Son, the hero, the savior, the rejuvenator of the world. This exoteric astrotheological variant of Christianity came complete with all its solar ritualistic trappings and was crafted to lead genuine Christians astray from truth so that they could never attain authentic Christ consciousness. This would be the perversion of the archetypal allegorical nature of the solar cult doctrine. Now the sun has obviously traditionally been used as a symbol of knowledge and truth since time immemorial. The sun has always represented the light of the creator. The true solar mythos is based in teaching people knowledge of the science of natural law. It is about inspiring them to understand their true conscience. And conscience means coming together with knowledge. Because it's con science. Con means come together to bring together. And then science, which is knowledge. Now this was to ensure that individuals would nurture right action in harmony with natural law, which is an exercise of conscience, knowledge of the difference between a right action and a wrong action. So this, the positive connotation to solar symbolism, is all about knowledge, not believing. This is about true gnosis. It has nothing to do with dogmatic faith and belief which are all the hallmarks of the perverted form of the solar doctrine. Now, many false Christians will have a very big problem with me correlating their teachings to astrotheology. I mean, in the past, I would have been executed for even asserting the idea in public if I was caught by the religious fervors of the day. So, we do need to recognize that we have a gift to be able to share this knowledge now without being at an extreme threat of violence. And this is why some of this knowledge was held in secrecy for so long was because of the threat of violence. I would highly recommend to fully flush out this topic. You should go to Santos Bonacci, especially his earlier work. I would also highly recommend The Hero Monolith by Joseph Campbell or even his book The Hero with a Thousand Faces. It's a good introduction to this. Um, the documentary Zeitgeist does a decent job on this subject as well. So the son, the hero, goes on his quest from birth to death each day, then which he is resurrected again. He is born or reborn on the spring equinox each day by the divine mother, the universe, and the moon. So since the moon is seen to rule the night sky as the, most, as the biggest and brightest object in the night sky, she is seen as 
the great mother and the universe is seen as her cloak. Now we can see this symbolism correlated in images of Mother Mary, where she wears her dark cloak speckled with stars, and she's giving birth to true Christ consciousness, which is looked upon allegorically as right action. So this really gives us a whole new look at the Thalamic saying, love under will, which is do what that will shall be the whole of the law. Love is the law, love under will. So this is that generative principle giving birth to right action, which is the sun, which is the light and the truth of the world. And if we look at this in the triune brain, we see that we could look at the reptilian complex as the father the oldest, and the limbic system as the mother, and then the neocortex as the divine son. So this is the trinity of consciousness. So what has happened is that we have overcome our reptilian instincts and become more empathic and activated our emotional sides. And then what this does is gives birth to the holistic level thinking of the neocortex which allows for right action to be manifested and i cannot leave out that this is a virgin birth now for us to move forward into our inquiry in astrotheology specifically solar doctrine we have to understand two basic modalities of of astronomy and that is what creates the seasons of the year and the other is the precession of the equinox. So the simplest way to explain what creates the seasons of the year is the tilt of the earth in relation to the plane that it orbits the sun. This is the main factor what creates the seasons, which is the tilt of the earth in relation to its orbit around the sun. Now, a lot of people will say, well, it has to do with our elliptical orbit. And when we look at the measurements that we see, we understand that it's not really due to the elliptical orbit. We really don't move that far away compared to how close we move. Um, we can generally just call it a circle, honestly. But um, so it's not that effective towards the seasons. What really is the main factor is the tilt of the earth like i said we can see this very clearly in the slide that i have provided and this slide also gives you an understanding of the northern hemisphere's difference with the southern hemisphere's difference in their relation with seasons so the answer to what creates seasons is the planet's own rotational axis and tilt in relation to the plane of orbit around the sun, which affects the way the light is hitting the planet. So on the spring equinox, the sun is at the equator. So it is exactly at zero degrees. And this is why we have the word equinox to symbolize this event. Um, the word equinox means equal night and day. So the sun is neither in the northern hemisphere nor the southern hemisphere. As the sun continues its journey, we come to the summer solstice, which is June 20th and 21st. Now, the sun has now progressed upward of a 23.5 degree angle into the northern hemisphere. So the angle at which the light is hitting the planet has changed by 23.5 degrees. And now that light is primarily hitting the northern hemisphere. As the sun continues its journey, we reach, we reach the autumn equinox, which is September 21st and 22nd. Now the sun has dropped back down to the equator because we are at the equinox again and then the sun falls into the winter solstice now it has moved into the southern hemisphere 
23.5 degrees. And as we can see on the diagram provided, the northern and southern hemisphere have their opposite seasons. This also relates to the law of correspondence. Now this process of waxing and waning creates a sine wave, which is crucial to understand. So I hope this section hasn't been too boring, but we do need to understand these basics. And please keep it in mind that I'm also trying to reach the layman's or even children with this information. So I'm just trying to fully extrapolate upon these ideas in the simplest way, but also bringing in enough detail that um, an advanced student could still get something from it. So now we're going to move on to the precession of the equinox. Now I'm not going to get into the full mechanics of every little mathematical detail that comes with understanding the precession, but we will give a general basic understanding like I said before. Basically what you need to know is that the 12 constellations of the zodiac belt shift every 2,000 years counterclockwise. So they, they are in the solar ecliptic pathway. So now let us visualize. So we're starting at the spring equinox and the constellation that the sun resides in or the house of the zodiac that the sun resides in, let's say it is Aries. Now, as these astronomical bodies move, we get this effect, which is known as the precession of the equinox. So every 2000 years, that background constellation slowly moves counterclockwise, and then we end up in the constellation of Taurus. And as this continues to process, we see that we will eventually complete a full cycle. So everything is shifting and right around roughly 2000 years, we see a new constellation on the spring equinox when the sun is rising. Now there is another framework to consider which a lot of people get confused the precession of the seven pole stars of Ursa Minor. And this has a lot of relevance to the ancient stellar cult mythos. But since we're not on that topic today, we will continue down this pathway. I just wanted to, I feel that if I didn't mention that here, people may not be able to stay oriented. So this is all about orientation. We're trying to stay oriented with the knowledge that we have, and what we are gathering, and the perspective, you know, the perspective of how we are viewing these things really makes a difference. This entire process of the precession of the equinox takes right around 24 to 25,000 years, maybe a little bit more or a little bit less. I round it off to 24 and round each age, which is each time that we spend or that the sun spends in the house on the spring equinox. So 2,000 years per house, and there's 12 houses, roughly 24,000 years. That's the easiest way to remember this. So we find this ancient hero's journey story all over the world. But to continue on this topic, I would like to bring up the wheel of the zodiac. So this is one of the simplest symbolic references we can look at to understand this journey. So the ancients took this zodiac wheel, which the sun travels through each house throughout the year, and they would quarter it to create the seasons or a map for the seasons. When they quartered it, it created the symbol of the cross. They also assigned three houses of the zodiac per season in these quarters. So we're going to begin this story properly at the spring equinox, which is technically the correct new year. So this is when the sun is born. So in the Egyptian mythology, this is Horus, Horus of the spring equinox. And this is where we get our word horizon, which is the zone of Horus. 
the hero begins his journey as he gains momentum and he reaches the midpoint of Taurus, the midpoint of the constellation of Taurus or the midpoint of spring, this is when you would get your bowls out to plow your gardens because this has to do with agriculture. See, all this is a way of us putting a finer point on time. And this is an advancement of our sciences and we're advancing our mathematics and our correlation to our sacred sciences on the ground, which is things like agriculture, one of the most sacred sciences because it was allowing for the production of food to become localized in so that we could create sanctuaries where we didn't have to be in survival mode all the time, which actually stimulates the evolution of the species. So this was a very important th this was a very important thing to know exactly when to get the soil ready for planting in the spring. But it also correlates to the charging momentum of the sun charging up its mountain to its highest point in the summer solstice. But when the sun is at the Sabbath midpoint this time of the year is also celebrated as May Day or Valpurgisnacht. So the sun is gaining momentum and is about to reach its highest apex of its journey. Summer solstice can be looked at as growth. The section or the time frame could be attributed to the principle of growth. Now this is when the hero reaches his apex and is about to reach its full potential but when the sun is at its most radiant the highest aspect summer solstice the summer solstice this in the egyptian mythology is raw because the sun's rays are the most radiant now the sun has entered into the house of cancer at this point and a little green language here cancer breaks down into can seer the one who can see, which makes sense because the sun is the brightest at this point of the year. This is also when we have the longest days of the year. Now, as full potential is reached in the next midpoint of the quarter of the zodiac in the summer. This is when the sun is the hottest in the year, which is the Leo constellation. Now, symbolically, this is on grounds of likeness because of the lion's mane is very radiant and resembles the sun. Also, the colors and because of its strength, persistence, and many other attributes that are associated with the lion that are correlated with the sun. And I'm sure a lot of people have seen pictures of lions that have suns for manes or the rays of the sun for manes now the sun moves into the house of virgo and as it reaches the autumn equinox in the house of virgo it returns back to the C to zero degrees the sun has now completed its northern hemisphere cycle so in the day cycle rather than the yearly cycle this is when Horus battles Set in the Egyptian mythology. So this is where we get sun set from, or even the word sit from, which is our bodies moving lower, the, the, the light of the world moving lower and about to sink into the underworld or the spirit realm. So Set conquers Horus. And now Horus has to move through the spirit realm or the Duat. Now the northern hemisphere cycle is associated with the material realm. Now this is on grounds of likeness because it is the most active part of the year. It is when we are in our masculine component where we are planting, working, and doing things, having fun. This is when the work is to be done physically out in the open. So the north is associated with a masculine principle, which is also associated with matter. And the southern hemisphere is associated with a feminine principle, which is associated with 
the spiritual realm or the spirit. Now it is very important to understand when the sun is in the house of Virgo on the autumn equinox, it is upon the constellation of crooks, which also translates to the cross. Now, this is where the Christian story really comes into the picture a little bit more clearly if people haven't started to pick up on that yet. Um, because this is when the sun starts to die. So it's looked at as the crucifixion. It's looked at as the crucifixion because the sun is upon the constellation of crooks. Now, this is because Virgo is above that constellation, and the sun is in the house of Virgo at this point. In this next quarter and season, the sun passes through Scorpio. Now, this one is the most easy to recognize as a zoo-type figure and its allegorical nature. I should briefly mention here that zodiac comes from zodiac, which has to do with animal archetype symbolism. So before things were anthropomorphized, all the zodiacal constellations were stored in animal types or zoo types. So the scorpion stings the sun and sends it to its coffin or its death. So we're now in the, the state of decay because we passed the autumn equinox and we've, the sun has fallen. So the sun is now in the state of decay. The sun has fallen into the sign of Scorpio. We started with birth at the spring equinox in the constellation of Aries. We moved to the constellation of Taurus, which is a Sabbath midpoint known as Valpurgisnacht. Then we moved into the sun's most apex, which is the summer solstice, and the sun moves into the house of Cancer. Then we moved into the next Sabbath midpoint, which is known as Lamas, and this is the constellation of Leo. And then we moved into the autumn equinox, where the sun is upon the crooks in the house of Virgo. And then we moved downward into the southern hemisphere, because the sun has completed its northern hemisphere journey, and now it is moving into the duat, the spirit realm, the underworld. And the sun is stung by the venomous scorpion, which sends the sun to its death in the winter solstice. This is known as the Tropic of Capricorn. And then the northern hemisphere, part of the zodiac, is known as the Tropic of Cancer. I should have mentioned that earlier, but I'm mentioning it here now. So when the sun reaches its coffin or complete death in the winter solstice, the sun moves into the house of Capricorn. The ancients knew that this was the lowest the sun was going to descend in its arc in the southern hemisphere. And they also knew that these would be the shortest days of the year. Now this in the Egyptian mythology is Osiris, the coffin of Osiris specifically. So we have Horus, which is birth in the spring equinox, Ra, which is growth at the summer solstice, Set, which is decay at the autumn equinox, and then Osiris, which is death at the winter solstice. Now this is when it is said that the sun has died upon the cross of the zodiac. This is when Jesus has died upon the cross. Now, going back to when the sun was at the autumn equinox, this is when the sun is placed upon the cross. This is not when he dies on the cross. And if I happen to have said that, I am sorry about that. The sun dies upon the cross of the zodiac on the winter solstice. Now, it is interesting to see that we pass through three houses, and that word house can be related to hours, and this correlates to the story that Jesus was upon the cross for three hours before he died. Not only is the word house correlated to hours, but also Horus. The word house and hours 
are correlated to Horus because Horus is the sun. And so is, and so is Ra, Set, and Osiris. They are all solar deities. They are all just different archetypal traits based upon where the sun is at and what its capabilities are on grounds of likeness. Especially to our psychology and our behaviors. So to the naked eye, the ancients could not see any movement of the sun when it died upon the cross in the winter solstice for at least three days. Now this is December 22nd. So for three days, the sun is seemingly still, which correlates back to death. So it's not until three days later from December 22nd that the arc of the sun begins to move back into the northern hemisphere. And that day is December the 25th, which is the birthday of the sun. Now, astrotheologically, the idea of the virgin birth comes into play here. Because of that processional slippage, at one point, the sun was born in the house of Virgo. It is also worth noting that if we count the months or moons, right? So now we're talking about the houses as months. Um, if we count them clockwise in nine months, which is the human gestation period, we will be at the house of Virgo. So sometimes when looking at the zodiac sign, we can see the houses as hours or months. And I like to make a correction. I meant counterclockwise. If we started at Virgo and counted backwards to the winter solstice, then this would be like the sun being born of a virgin under Virgo and carried to full term, where then he is reborn. Now we can find this story embedded in Egyptian architecture, specifically the Sphinx, which is the great mother of the divine sun. Now the Sphinx is facing eastward, and it is also a lion and a female put together. This represents the constellations of Leo and Virgo. So the sun is born and makes its arc and continues on its journey until it reaches its final stage of death in the winter solstice. So this takes a lot of orientation to fully understand because these signs are shifting and during the periods that these signs are shifting, we get different phases of the mythology and different evolutions of the mythology. So we're just trying to piece it all together and get a synchronistic point of view of how this all works. So now the sun is on its trek back upward to the spring equinox. The sun moves to the house of Aquarius, which is the water bringer or the bearer of water. And this is because the winters are now starting to thaw out and the frost and snow are turning to water. I'd also like to mention here that the other Sabbath midpoint is Sawan, and it looks like it's pronounced Samhain, the way it's spelled S-A-M-H-A-I-N, but it's Sawan. And I believe that's Gaelic or Irish or something like that. I, I can't quite remember, but you can look it up. And then the next Sabbath midpoint in the middle of Aquarius is Candlemas. So after three days, now we're looking at the signs as days, the sun is resurrected at the spring equinox. This is the emergence from the tomb, whereas at the beginning it was the emergence from the womb, the great mother's womb. There's no doubt that it is synchronistic that these words work out this way. And that day of resurrection is Easter Sunday. And if we just break down East Star Sun Day, we can see that these are all concepts associated with astrotheology and astronomy. It is very important to note here that Easter Sunday does not fall upon the same date each year. It is always the first Sunday, the day of worship for solar cult, after the first full moon. Now, the full moon represents the feminine goddess carrying to term with her full belly 
in her last semester. So the moon goddess has to become full symbolically to bear the divine sun after the spring equinox. Now this completes the story of the sun. This also completes the story of Horus and Jesus, the light of the world, performs miracles, rises from the dead after three days, has a virgin birth, is a son of God, has 12 helpers or 12 apostles, the 12 zodiac signs. This is the savior myth or the hero's journey or story. And many other solar deity names. There are so many. And probably on the next episode, I will give a list because we are running short on time for this episode. So I will be continuing this episode. Um, I will be continuing astrotheology in the next episode. But all right, listeners, that's all the time we have for today's episode. I really hope that I've shed some light upon astrotheology and religion in general. I look forward to sharing more of this information on the next episode. And you can find more of our shows, presentations, and news at the Cubbyhole website. That's C-U-B-B-Y-W-H-O-L-E dot com. And just as a reminder, new shows come out every Monday at 6 p.m. Pacific Time and every Friday at 12 p.m. Pacific Time. Stay tuned for more episodes on mind control, the occult, esotericism, consciousness, ancient origins, and the hidden mysteries that we've all been struggling to understand. I hope that this show has provided a great place for people to come and really get the tapestry, the full view of what's going on in our world and how all these things are interconnected. Thank you very much and keep transcending dogma.